That was a new song to me, but I love the words. They're very nice. Something rather nice happened to me during the week. I was out shopping at Pack and Save, and as I went through the checkout, the girl, the checkout operator said, you know, she's really, really pleasant. She said, as they all say these days, and how was your day? And I said, well, I've just been visiting my husband in hospital. Oh, she said, I'll pray for you. You know, that was so nice. And then she said, what church do you go to? And I told her, and she said, oh, you'll know Ethel. And I said, yes, I know Ethel. And she said, she helped me through, and taught me what to do when she worked at Selwyn Village. Her, her name is Cassie, I think that was her name. And she said, just before I finished, she said, I will be praying for you. You know, you don't know, do you, what your effect might have on other people. And sometimes, well, I was surprised. And then, of course, she was quite open about where she had met up with Ethel. And I thought that was really nice. It's time for our prayer now. So would you please kneel if you're able. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful that we can be here today. We thank you for too that the pews are filled and we thank you that you have given us the peace and that you have given us direction to come here today. Lord, we think of the people in Christchurch today in the surrounding areas where they've had this big earthquake and we know that there will be many people suffering from shock, suffering too because their buildings are destroyed. Some of them, I understand, have been laid flat. And this will be a big surprise and a big to shock to so many people. And Lord, we have to realise that we are living on borrowed time and that calamities can happen to us when we least expect them. And we pray that you'll be with those people who have suffered and that you will comfort each one of them. We pray too that our Adventist congregations will be able to meet in their churches as per usual. We don't know the situation there as yet. And today, Lord, we think about the ch our churches throughout the world. We ask that the Holy Spirit might be there to direct and to help and to teach because many, many people will be gathered there in our churches as, as the 24-hour time goes around the world, Lord. And we pray that many people will come because they have a thirsting of a knowledge of you. But we also know, Lord, that there are many ministers who have many, many churches to look after. And it is difficult for them to go around each one of them. Today, Lord, we would ask that your Holy Spirit would be here to teach us and that you will be with Claire as she takes our sermon for us. We know that she has put in much time and that you will guide her and give her clarity of speech as she talks to us. We think of those who are not as fortunate as we are. We think of the people in Pakistan and the dreadful things that have happened to them there, the floods and that many people have lost their homes and that they are starving. And we realise too that your coming must be hastened. And so we ask today that you will forgive us for the sins that we have committed. You will help us to come and have a fresh glimpse of you today and that you will bless each one of us and help us to be mindful that Jesus gave his all for us and help us that we should give our all to him because we do ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I um, thank you. <laughs> I spoke to my sister who lives in Christchurch this morning, and um, yes, she's feeling very glad that the plates in her pantry on the top shelf are 
only a third of the way off the edge and didn't come all the way off. She did lose a couple of photo frames and various things, and it's a bit of a mess in the garage, but she's quite lucky. My auntie um, is missing a chimney and um, has a few broken windows and things, so yeah, it's, you know, they're counting their Sabbath day's blessings, and I think, yeah, it is a timely reminder that, you know, things can suddenly kind of change. It's, um, yeah, when it's that close to home. So, um, yeah. Alrighty. It's early morning and a grey mist surrounds the countryside like a blanket. The air is still, but if you listen carefully, you can hear the soft crunch of leaves underfoot. And if you look a little closer, a hunched, shrouded figure can be seen skulking his way through the trees at the edge of a field. He's stooped down and it looks like he's weighed down by something and he is in fact because he has a heavy rucksack of silver on his back. But it's not just this that makes him feel heavy and weighed down because his mind is also heavy with the thought of what he has done, of what he has fallen to. He should be feeling free right now. He's spent 19 years in a prison labour camp, but now he's no longer bound by chains. And yet he still feels as if a chain holds itself tightly around him, sucking his very life. Life has been unkind to him. Originally, he was imprisoned for stealing bread to feed his sister's starving family. He didn't see much wrong in that, but then he'd attempted to escape and, and his other escapades had lengthened his sentence to nearly two decades. It should all be past history now. He was free, in theory at least, because he was still forever marked as a convict forced to carry a yellow ticket of leave so that everyone would know. And it was a rare few people who could see past this. There was a few, though, and one was the bishop with whom he had lodged last night. This man had treated him as if he was a regular member of society, in spite of the fact that he knew his ugly past. He'd still allowed him to share his food, and he'd offered him a bed for the night. And the reason this man's mind was so heavy was because he'd repaid this man's kindness with evil, and here he was creeping away early in the morning, taking with him the bishop's best silverware. Never had he felt so despicable. Surely there was no hope for a man such as him. So he almost felt a sense of relief when, while he hurried across an open field, the law caught up with him. And as the contents of his sack were investigated and he was duly marched back to the bishop's house, he knew in his heart that he deserved every bit of what was coming to him. He was rather surprised, however, because the outcome wasn't what he expected. For when the story was told, the look on the bishop's face was not one of anger or disgust or disappointment like he expected to see. Instead, there was a look of pity and there was even a twinkle in the good bishop's eyes as he spoke to the man of, men of the law. He said to them, This man isn't a thief. I gave him this silverware. In fact, here you are, sir. You left these behind. Did you forget I gave them to you as well? And he hands him two more silver candlesticks. And the bishop reminds the man that he has promised to use the silver to become an honest man. Now, there was never such a promise made. He did this out of kindness or grace. He gave him a second chance. This man had stolen the silverware, but this bishop gave him a chance to go free, throw justice away in the face of mercy, and give this man another chance at life. And this single event of kindness changed the course of this man's life forever. He didn't deserve it. It was given freely, no strings attached, purely out of the goodness of the bishop's heart in spite of everything he'd done. And suddenly, no longer is this man simply prisoner 24601. He is a man who someone cares for enough to make a difference in his life. Some of you may have already picked up on who this story refers to. The name is Jean Valjean. 
The Place is France, the year 1815, and the story is told in the epic no novel Les Miserables. If you're familiar with this tale and its many intricate plots and themes, I've got no intention of exploring these in, in great detail this morning, but there is this one theme throughout the story which has always spoken to my heart as a Christian, and it's so powerful that um, I wanted to share it with you because I think its message is one that can touch our lives. Jean Valjean goes on to assume a false identity, changes his name, and under this guise, he becomes a successful businessman and the mayor of a town. He remembers the kindness that was shown to him by the bishop, and so he does his very best to show the same kindness to those he come, comes in contact with. He becomes known as a benevolent factory owner and a wise mayor. However, his past still attempts to catch up with him. You see, the police inspector of the town is a man by the name of Javier. And this man, it so happens, used to be a guard at the prison camp where Valjean served his time. Javier, the, prison, the poli police inspector, is an upright man. He follows the law to the letter and he expects all others to do the same. And when Javier realises that the mayor of his town is actually prisoner 24601 from the prison camp, he's horrified. He believes that there's no way someone who had broken the law so many times could ever be suitable for a mayor, no matter how kind and benevolent he is. He had chosen willingly to break the law, and not just on one occasion either. Javier wishes to see Jean Valjean pay fully for his misdemeanours, not only for his original crimes, but also for hiding the truth in the ensuing years. He ignores any good that Valjean might currently be doing in the town, for in, in Javier's eyes, the law must be obeyed in every instance, and however benevolent he is, Valjean is still an ex-convict, hiding behind a false identity, and he must be brought to justice. Many years later, both men end up in Paris, and Javier, who was unable to um, deal out any punishment to him earlier on, he again, again discovers his former prisoner. And I won't go into detail of the other attempts that Javier makes on Valjean's life, but um, each time he is unsuccessful, bearing in mind this is a novel. So, um, yeah, each time Valjean manages to escape and then suddenly there's an um, ironic twist of events and they end up in a situation where Valjean has the upper hand and he has the chance to do away with Javier, with this man who has hunted him down for all these years. But yet, instead of doing away with him, instead of taking his life, Valjean chooses to let him go free. And this is more than Javier can fathom. Why would anyone do something for this? Do something like this for someone who had so often attempted to take his life? He's been offered grace and somehow this changes things. He can't figure it, figure it out. But when again he meets up with Valjean and again he, he has the chance to take his life, he finds himself letting him go and granting him time. Javier realises that he's caught up between his firm belief in the law and the mercy that Valjean has shown to him. He doesn't feel like he can give him up to the authorities any longer because he's been shown such kindness by the man. There's a sad end to this part of the story because Javier doesn't choose to embrace this grace that um, Valjean offered him. He chooses instead to commit suicide, throwing himself into the River Seine because he cannot handle the fact that the law was not uphold and that grace came in place of it. He suddenly discovered that what he thought was the right thing was in fact not right at all and it left him terribly confused. Because, you see, according to the law, Valjean was guilty. He was guilty of so many crimes that it's hard to know where to start. Some of them were deliberate, intentional acts of evil, evil misdoing, like stealing the silver. But others, like when he originally stole the bread for his family, they were misguided attempts at doing good. But either way, according to the law of the land, he was condemned. His yellow passport marks him as a convict for the rest of his life, and there's no way he can escape this. 
And yet, in spite of his convictions, he is shown mercy. And this act of being shown mercy by someone else had such a huge effect on Valjean that it changed his entire life. Realising that someone cared enough to do this for him created in him a desire to show the same mercy to others, even to his arch enemy, Javier. I'd like to tell you another short story now. And it's about three goats. Not the fairy tale, don't worry. But there are... Um, Three goats, it is a big, big one, a middle-sized one, and a small one that live on our property. And I've noticed that amongst the goats, there's developed a bit of a hierarchy. And the biggest one is definitely the boss. The smaller one is quite happily happy. The smallest one is happy to let the biggest one be the boss. And the one in the middle has kind of become a bit of an outcast because he's the smaller of the two males. He's not in charge, but he wants to be. And so he ends up getting pushed away and um, if I go down to take them some pellets or something, the um, biggest one will get plenty, and the smallest one will get some too if she's patient, but the other one stands off to the side and doesn't even get a look in. And, you know, I used to feel really sorry for him. His name's Billy. Very original, I know. I didn't name him. But um, I used to feel really sorry for him and try and sort of sneak him some pellets when the others weren't looking. But recently, I've become a bit less sympathetic towards the goat because um, there's been a few times when the biggest goat has been off in a different part of the property. And when that happens, and there's just the two smaller ones, all of a sudden, Billy is the boss. He's the biggest out of the two, and so he's in charge. And the way he treats the smaller one when he's in charge is not very nice. You'd think that, you know, he knows what it's like to be an outcast. He might sort of understand, but no, he's not very nice. And the Bible has a parable which is very similar to this. I just thought I'd share my little parable first. But if you turn to Matthew 18, verse 23 to 34, we have the story of the unmerciful servant. It says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began, to, as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents, a lot of money, was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. So the servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt and let him go. But when the, that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii which was a very small amount. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And in his anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. You know, as, as sinners, all of us deserve the results of our sin, just as the first servant deserved the results of not paying back his debt, and yet he was shown mercy. God had a perfect setup in our world, a world set up in perfect order if only it followed the laws he created. And yet Satan thought he could better it. He thought we'd be better off without the restraint of laws. But if you look at the world around us, I think you'll soon see how remarkably humans have managed to mess it up. Because of greed, there are millions of starving people around the world. Hunger for power has led to battles and the loss of millions of lives. Wanting to live with the freedom to do exactly as we feel like, uninhibited by moral laws, has led to AIDS, abortion, broken homes and messed up lives. I have to admit, I really struggle to understand the, the common philosophy these days that somehow humankind is at the pinnacle of the evolutionary process and somehow we're getting better and better all the time. It just doesn't add up to me because it seems that whatever breakthroughs modern man makes, somehow they get used in a way that just causes more problems to more people. 
It seems to me as if the only thing we as humans are really gifted at is making mistakes. And we bring it on ourselves. We deserve to die. And yet, in spite of all we've done, God has offered us grace, offered us a second chance, no matter how undeserving it is. We don't deserve it any more than Valjean deserved to be helped out by the bishop who he'd just stolen from. And when we, stu- when we truly understand what that means, it will change us, and we won't be like Billy the Goat or Police Inspector Javier or the unmerciful servant in the parable. Instead, we will embrace this gift of grace that's given to us and we'll pass it on to others. I believe, though, that there's a bit of a common misconception that sometimes occurs around this concept of grace. We can end up with an unreal expectation, unrealistic expectation of ourselves that somehow if we truly believe or if our belief is strong enough, then somehow that means we've accepted this gift of grace, that somehow then we'll be able to do the right things and it's that that will get us to heaven. We can start to try and focus our attention on trying to figure out exactly which behaviours God expects of someone who loves him. And we start to worry that if we don't get it all right, then somehow we're going to be excluded from this gift of grace. In my own personal journey, I spent a lot of time over the last few years trying to figure out what was right. For me, it wasn't so much about sort of behaviour-related things, you know, eating the right things or doing the right things, but I got stuck on having the right philosophy about, about life, coming to the right conclusions about God. I knew that I believed in a creator God and I wanted to do what he wanted me to do, but I had great trouble trying to figure out exactly what that was. I didn't want to just follow along blindly, hoping I was on the right track, but the more I tried, it seemed the more confused I became. And then, not long ago, in a Bible study group that I'm part of, we started a study on the topic of grace. And as we went along, and I became more and more, more, and more immersed in this study, more immersed in God's grace and what it means to us, I suddenly started to discover something. Because instead of focusing on what God wanted of me, I was just focusing on God. And all of a sudden, I was starting to think of ways to help people. I was learning to hold my tongue, and I was doing things that I never thought I was really struggling with when I was trying to actually focus on getting them right. By no means did I get anywhere close to becoming perfect, but I just started to slowly notice that when I actually focused on God, that's when I began to change. And it's definitely dependent on an ongoing focus on God and his grace because if I don't spend time dwelling on God and what he's done for us, I soon soon stop thinking about how he'd want me to treat others, if that makes sense. Um, I grew up in a Christian family, in an Adventist family, and um, grew up hearing about grace. And yet somehow... Sometime in my childhood, I developed this picture in my mind. It wasn't something I sort of dwelt on very often, but occasionally I'd refer back to it. And the picture was of a pit, a big, deep pit. And at the bottom was a murky, mucky mire, and the top there was sort of light and warmth. And I sort of imagined that I was climbing up sort of the brick stone wall of this pit, trying to get to the top. And at various stages in my life, I'd sort of imagine where I was in this pit. Sometimes I felt I was sort of climbing steadily, making good progress. Things were going okay. Other times I felt like for every one step forward, I was taking five steps back kind of thing and really struggling to hold on. And occasionally in the pit of despair, I felt like I was just wallowing in the mud in the bottom and going absolutely nowhere. But recently, and particularly since I've I've started studying grace and what it really means, my picture of this pit has changed. You see, now I realise that I'm not actually climbing up that wall because Jesus is in that pit and he's the one that's climbing the wall and my job is not actually to climb the wall and figure it all out and get it all right but my job is actually to focus on him and to focus on clinging to him not because he's going to let me go I know he never would but he will give me the choice and if I choose I can go back to climbing the wall on my own and because I'm human That seems to happen on a fairly regular basis and I start stressing and worrying about things and things don't go right and before I know it, I'm trying to figure it out on my own again instead of focusing on clinging to him and letting him climb the wall. 
In Matthew 25, we read that on the judgment day, God is going to divide the sheep from the goats. I have to admit, I'm not very fond of this illustration, considering I'm rather partial to goats, but anyhow. Um, You'll notice that God says of the sheep in verse 35, I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink, and so forth. Notice that it doesn't actually say, I asked you to keep the Sabbath, and you kept it to the letter. I asked you to eat healthily and take good care of your bodies, and you never touched meat in your life. Now, don't by any means think I'm saying we shouldn't keep the Sabbath or take care of our bodies, but I think sometimes if we're so focused on getting these things right, we might not be focusing on the very means of our salvation. And of course, we need to remember that on this judgment day, if we are saved by grace, then God isn't going to be looking down at a list of all our many mistakes, because what he's going to see is Jesus taking our place, and it's his love and his kindness to others that is going to be shown. Luke 15, verses 11 to 32, tell a story of the prodigal son. And I think the prodigal son is much like Valjean in our earlier story. The prodigal son went out and squandered his father's money on wild living. And when it all went wrong, he knew he'd gotten what he deserved. He deserved to be out with the pigs. He hoped that he could earn back some favour with his father by working as a hired hand. But he knew he didn't even deserve that. But like the good bishop in the story of Les Mis, the father of this prodigal son offers him grace, pure, undeserved favour in spite of everything he'd done wrong, just as God offers to us. The son only had to accept the father's offer to become a son again. Of course, we don't actually know what happened next. And I hope that, like Valjean, he truly accepted this gift of love and that it changed him, and that he went on to extend this grace to others. Let's hope that he wasn't like the unmerciful servant, or Billy the goat, who never really grasped what is given to them. And the older brother in this story reminds me of Javier, someone who followed the rules all his life, but somehow had missed out on the whole reasoning behind the rules. Someone who was so caught up in what was right that he failed to see the power of grace. I found a quote recently, which I think kind of ties this in well. It's talking about the Bible, and it says, the Bible is to us what the star was to the wise men, which I guess it's a guide, you know, it's how we... It's something we follow to live our lives. The Bible is to us what the star was to the wise men, but if we spend all our time in gazing upon it, observing its motions and admiring its splendour, without being led to Christ by it, the use of it will be lost to us. And that's a quote from Thomas Adams. And I'd like to leave you with that thought today. I'll read it again. The Bible is to us what the star was to the wise men. But if we spend all our time in gazing upon it, observing its motions and admiring its splendor without being led to Christ by it, the use of it will be lost to us. So I leave you with that thought. Focus on Christ and his gift of grace to you. Let it change you, guide you, renew you, and draw you closer to him. And we're going to sing now um, Amazing Grace, which I think really suits this. Oh 
chains are gone I've been set free My God, my Savior Has ransomed me And like a flood His mercy God, thank you so much for your amazing grace. Thank you that we don't have to do it all on our own. Thank you that we have you there in that pit with us and that our job is to cling to you. Help us. Please send your Holy Spirit to help us um, cling to you and keep our focus on you as we go about our daily lives and just be with us as we go into this coming week. In your name, amen.